Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my week one 2019 NFL predictions. Well, I am really excited to be back for another football season. Uh, it just feels like the last um, seven months have gone by incredibly fast um, with the off season. Um, it's exciting to be at this time of the year where for the next 20 weeks or so there's going to be football games on that matter and they're going to, they're going to decide the season. And I'm excited to be back for another year. Uh, I want to tell everybody that I remember last season there were weeks uh, due, to, uh, due to my school scheduling a lot that I wasn't able to make videos for certain weeks of the season. Uh, my plan for this year it, or for this season is to be able to make weekly videos and provide you know those picks for the entire season. Um, so that is my that is my plan, and I hope to uh, be able to uh, fulfill that through the entire season. Um, I am excited for all my viewers, um, previous and new ones, to uh, to watch me you know make my predictions and talk about them. Uh, I'm going to try to improve on the seasons I had from last year. I ended up about sixty two and a half percent even for uh, or 62 and a half percent in terms of straight up while with against the spread I ended up with 52 percent so you know I, I'm hoping to uh, up those averages for this year to get to about 65 and about 56 to 58 for me against I, I feel pretty good about that uh, for this season um, for all the viewers out there uh, new and old I, I, I wanted to say, said the last couple years, if you have any disrespectful, uh, mean-spirited, hateful comments towards me for my predictions or analysis or, um, yeah, if you have any of those kind of comments, pick another, watch another video. If you don't like, if you don't like what I have to say, go find another YouTuber that has your opinions and watch them or... Everybody today has cameras on their, on their phones or on their computers or, or make your own videos, you know. Take the time to, you know, sit down and pr pr produce your own thoughts about football and predictions and, and your thoughts. And let people talk to you that way and so you can express your own thoughts. But if you have any hateful, mean-spirited comments towards me and my predictions for, for, for what I said, just don't watch. Or make your own vids. Alright? So with that out of the way, I'm going to do uh, what I do at, for the last few years. I'm going to give everybody my prediction for Super Bowl 53. Oh, I'm sorry, Super Bowl 50, uh, 54. I'm going to give everybody my prediction for Super Bowl 54. And the prediction for me is this year I'm going to go with a rematch from Super Bowl 52. I'm going to take the New England Patriots to take on the Philadelphia Eagles. But unlike Super Bowl 52... I am going to take the Patriots to win this game. Um, this is one of those things where, for me, until I guess until Belichick or Brady retire, you have to go uh, with the Patriots to get into the Super Bowl every year. Um, that if Tom Brady goes down or you know if something happens, they it, it could definitely change. But until the Patriots prove that they don't get in there or prove that they can't get there. You have to go with them uh, to get to the Super Bowl. And for me, with the Eagles, they're the most, they're the youngest, most consistent, and most confident team I have in terms of the NFC. There, there, there are great teams in the NFC, and there is much more parity in the NFC compared to the AFC, where especially with Andrew Luck retiring, you're going to have basically the Pats and the Chiefs as the genuine contenders where everybody else has good teams but you have concerns or just you you know their histories and stories and you just know at the end that the regular seasons don't matter and it's up to them in the postseason to really make a difference uh two examples of the afc texans and chargers um but i digress um but i'm gonna take the eagles because i i feel like they should be the most confident they were basically one Alshon Jeff Jeffrey drop from getting back to another entry championship game. That core is still going to be basically all together, which I think is significant. Um, I like Doug Peterson a lot as a head coach. I think he's one of the top five head coach 
in the league. You have one of the top five offensive lines. You have a top two tight end, Zach Ertz. You have Jordan Howard coming in to go with Miles Sanders and uh, Corey Clement and Darren Sproles, probably the best running back depth group you have in terms of pure talent. Um, you have a the only the only question I still have the Eagles is their secondary. You have some young guys I think are effective, but there are other you know things with the safeties of Malcolm and Rodney. You have Andre, uh, Anderson Deho going in to bring in depth. Um, I just really liked how this Eagles team is shaped up. I know what people are going to say. It's all also on Carson Wentz's health. And I will admit that, that if Carson Wentz goes down of an injury, my whole theory uh, for the Eagles is done. And for everybody out there, I think you're going to have to genuinely question Carson Wentz's um, uh, the, the, the reasoning or the... Um, was it right to sign Carson Wentz to a four-year, $128 million deal for $108 million guaranteed? Or, um, and also you're going to have the Nick Foles people saying, see, we never should have given up on him. Um, but I believe Carson Wentz will be able to stay healthy for a majority of this year. I think that maybe if he misses one or two games, that'll be okay. But if he misses more than that, I think the Eagles are going to be done. Um, but I just trust the Eagles enough to be able to pull – out a game like uh, to pull out in the NFC and get to play the Patriots in an exciting rematch from a couple years ago. Um, so that's my reasoning for my Super Bowl pick. And now let me get into my week one picks. All right. So this Thursday for the 100th season to kick off, it's going to be the oldest rivalry in the NFL renewed as the Green Bay Packers go to the Chicago Bears um, in the opening game of the year. Um, the Bears are three-point favorites in this game. I like Chicago minus three, and Chicago straight up. And then the next game, and then the, the slate of Sunday games. Um, when the Tennessee Titans go to the Cleveland Browns in First Energy Stadium, the Cleveland Browns are five-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. I like the Titans here plus five-and-a-half. I like the Titans here to cover plus five-and-a-half, but I'm going to take the Cleveland Browns straight up. Then the next game, when the Baltimore Ravens go to Hard Rock Stadium to take on the Miami Dolphins. The Baltimore Ravens are seven-point favorites in this game. I like Baltimore here, minus seven, and Baltimore straight up. Then the next game, when the Atlanta Falcons go to the Minnesota Vikings and U.S. Bank Stadium. The Vikings are four-point favorites in this game, but I like Atlanta here, plus four, and Atlanta straight up. Then the next game, when the Buffalo Bills go to MetLife Stadium to take on the New York Jets, this game was so close to me. Like, I'm going to take the Jets to win straight up, but I hedged my bets, and I would not be surprised if Buffalo could pull this victory out. Um, but I, I'm going to take Buffalo here plus three, but I'm taking the Jets straight up. So if you want to get at me for hedging my bets, fine. But I think this game is that evenly competitive uh, that it could be very effective that way. Um, then the next game, when the next game, uh, when the Washington Redskins go to the link to take on the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles are nine-point favorites in this game. I like the Eagles to win straight up, but I'm taking Washington here plus nine. Uh, then the next game, when the L.A. Rams go to Bank of America Stadium to take on the Carolina Panthers, the Rams are three-point favorites in this game. I like the Rams here minus three, and the L.A. Rams straight up. Then the next game, when the Kansas City Chiefs go to the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Kansas City Chiefs are four-point favorites in this game. I like Kansas City here minus four, and Kansas City straight up. Then the next game, when the Indianapolis Colts go to the Dignity Health Center in Los Angeles uh, to take on the L.A. Chargers, the L.A. Chargers are six and a half point favorites in this game. I like the Chargers here, minus six and a half, and the Chargers straight up. Then the next game, when the Cincinnati Bengals go to CenturyLink Field to take on the Seattle Seahawks, and the biggest favorite of the week, and my biggest favorite to take uh, this week, uh, the Seahawks are nine and a half point favorites in this game. I like Seattle here, minus 9.5, and, and Seattle straight up. Then the next game, when the New York Giants go to the Dallas Cowboys, the Cowboys are 7-point favorites in this game. I like the Cowboys to win, but I'm taking the New York Giants, plus 7. Then the next game, when the Detroit Lions go to State Farm Stadium, take on the Arizona Cardinals, the Lions are 2.5-point favorites in this game. I like Detroit here, minus 2.5, and, and Detroit straight up. Then the next game, when the Niners go to Raymond James Stadium to take on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, this game is a pick em right now, and I'm going to take the Niners with that pick em against the spread and the Niners straight up. And then the next game, when the Steelers go to the New England Patriots, the Patriots are six-point favorites in this game. I like the Patriots here, minus six, and the Patriots straight up. 
And then the next game, the two Monday night games, to end the first week of the year, the Texans are seven-point underdogs taking on the New Orleans Saints. I'd like the Saints here to win straight up, but I'm going to take the Houston Texans here plus seven. And then finally, to wrap up the week, the Denver Broncos are going to the Oakland Alamay Coliseum to take on the Oakland Raiders. This game is a pick em, and I'm going to take the Denver Broncos against the spread in the Denver Broncos straight up. Um, all right, so time for my thoughts on each game. The Bears over the Packers. This is a game to me where the reason why I'm taking the Bears is I'm trusting the consistency and the camaraderie of the Bears versus the Packers. The Packers are better this year. They got a brand new coach in Matt LaFleur, the former offensive coordinator of the Tennessee Titans, former quarterback coach for the LA Rams under Sean McVay the year before. Um, I thought Mike McCarthy was justifiably fired because after having the injury excuse in 2017, he had Aaron Rodgers for 15 straight games and they could they only won one road game against the Jets where I don't even think he was the coach for that. But um, So you have a brand new head coach in Matt LaFleur who's one of the younger coaches out there. And the problem is now Aaron Rodgers has the most cachet out of anybody in that organization. Um, and I don't think he's really going to listen to Matt. He's going to do his own thing still. He, you know, Matt may be more, you know, innovative. He may be younger. He's got, you know, fresher ideas. But I think that's going to be a tough thing about this relationship. Um, I do want to give the Packers credit for spending a lot of money in free agency for the first time in years. If you look at what the Packers did in free agency... Um, signing guys like Billy Turner. That was an awkward move, but they had an offensive line for that, which, which, which was a good thing because I think um, they had to cut one of their offensive linemen. So you added Billy Turner. You added Preston Smith. You added Zadarius Smith. You added uh, Adrian Amos. You added um, bit of a, um, you added Darnell Savage in the draft. You added Rashawn Gary in the draft. Um, you cut Mike Daniels. Which was definitely probably the other move I did not like. I thought Mike Daniels was still a solid player. Um, I thought Mike Daniels was going to a contender. But obviously, the division pool, he pulled Gerald McCoy and said, You know what? Winning, I don't really care about. I care about my money and I care about getting revenge in the division. So, Mike Dan, you know, Mike Daniels going is now a Detroit Lion. Um, and I think the Packers' defense, it will be better. I think Mike Pettin is an okay defensive coordinator. Uh, and But actually now, since the Packers have spent money... On their defensive pieces, he has a defense that has a lot of talent on it, and Mike Pettin is is under the Rex Ryan school of thought. So I think Mike will do an effective job with this defense. Um, but I look at the Bears, and the reason why I'm taking the Bears is that besides two moves in the offseason, you can criticize the Bears for number one, Jordan Howard getting traded for a six round pick. That was stupid. Um, Duke Johnson for the Texans was, or Duke Johnson was given from the Browns for a fourth round pick. And if someone and if someone tells me that Duke Johnson is better than Jordan Howard, then you you are very wrong, and you just are a huge Duke Johnson fan or a huge Miami fan, but either one of the two. Um, but if you look at what you can criticize the Bears for that, because I, I, th- I thought that was a bad move. And number two was you were not able to get a deal back with Robbie Gold for your kicking job. He's always wanted to go back to Chicago. He held out for a majority of this season because we all thought that he wanted to go to Chicago. Well, obviously. Uh, over the last a few weeks ago, about a month ago, Robbie Gold kind of kind of irritated me a little bit. He kind of showed that all that phony, you know, all that hometown stuff was a bunch of crap, uh, and it was just about money because there was no there was no reason. Like it's like, well, I'm not going to negotiate with the Niners. Oh well, let's give you money. Okay, I'll stay with the Niners for at least four years. I know there's an opt out after two, but yeah, I'll stay with the Niners. So yeah, Robbie, it really wasn't about going home, <laughs> you know. So yeah, so. Those are the only two things that you can maybe criticize the Bears with. They re-signed Charles Leno to an extension. They have Cody Whitehair under an extension. And you basically have that entire core team basically back together for for another year. Um, I think that the way Matt Nagy was able to create that offense and generate it and a call plays was very entertaining. He's got a lot of Sean McVay in him. And you could actually maybe give Matt Nagy a little more credit because he's working with more limited ceiling with the talent he has around him. Unlike the Rams. Um, but the reason why I'm taking the Bears is that continuity. I don't know how Mike Patton and that defense are going to work together their first game in Chicago. I know what that Bears defense is going to do with Chuck Pagano at the helm. Is Chuck Pagano a downgrade from Vic Mangia? Absolutely. Um, but he is a solid defensive coordinator. He has a lot of NFL experience. And he's got one of the easiest jobs in the league. having Getting to work with Khalil Mack 
Roquan Smith, Akeem Hicks, um, Ed, Eddie Goldman, and all those Bears defenders. But basically what they're doing is, you know, you know, you you teach me the playbook. I will make the, you know, I will look at the calls and we will work around you. Um, the Last year in that Bear, in Soldier Field, Aaron Rodgers' consecutive throw streak of an interception ended. I could see definitely him throwing another interception in this game. Um, he's not going to have Aaron Jones because I think Aaron Jones is serving a one game suspension or one or two game suspension from a DUI incident from 2017. And if I'm the Bears, it's an easy thing that I'm going to do for them: take double team Devontae and have Aaron Rodgers throw to St. Brown, Scantling, um, Geronimo Allison, and let let him let those guys beat you. Don't let Devontae Adams beat you because he's the, he's his most reliable weapon. And maybe let's see if Jimmy Graham can do anything. Because Jimmy Graham was paid $10 million, and he could not do anything for the Packers. But also, again, you could just say, the Packers have never been a really tight and friendly offense under Aaron Rodgers. I think the game is going to be great. I think it's going to be competitive. But I'm taking the Bears here because I'm going to trust the home field advantage. I'm going to take the Bears' continuity. And I think the Bears' defense can cause enough problems with Rodgers, especially with his injury history. You know, I think that they can get him again and get enough stops or one extra turnover to win this game. So that's like the Bears here minus three and the Bears straight up. The next game, the Browns over the Titans. This one to me is one where the Browns, um, they were probably one of the most talked about, if not uh, the most talked about team in the entire NFL this past offseason for all the moves they made in terms of free agency, in terms of drafting, and in terms of just creating a team and an atmosphere that has everybody talking about them getting to the Super Bowl. Um, when you get Odell Beckham, when you get um, uh, Sheldon Richardson, when you get Olivier Vernon, when you uh, draft uh, Greedy Williams, when you sign Kareem Hunt, when you have an offensive line that, you know, they, they don't have their most effective weapon and they just cut Greg Robinson a couple days ago. Um, so I don't even you know I would expect him to come back. Um, you have Denzel Ward. You have, uh, they, they let Jabril Peppers go, but I, I think they brought in Morgan Burnett. Like, you know, you have a talented roster of veterans and young guys and a hungry locker room in City that is ready to prove that the Browns, for the first time since, like, 1994, they are not pushovers and they are genuine threats to make the playoffs and make some noise. Um, so I would say to all Browns fans and all fans in the NFL, expect the Browns to be in the playoffs. For AFC North fans, including myself, Steeler, and Bengal fans, expect the Cleveland Browns to win the AFC North for the first time since they've come back, and the first time since, the first time ever, since the divisions have been realigned. But for the Super Bowl aspirations, I would tell everybody, pump the brakes on those. The Super Bowl is not going to be, in my opinion, in the Browns' future. I look at the Browns as this incredibly hungry team that's going to be very good. But I think a lot of their thing is going to be, the, the problem is going to be, I don't trust Freddie Kitchen's ability as a head coach. Because remember, this this guy's rise to a head coach. He definitely took some shortcuts or just was definitely, Baker gave him a pass. Or Baker gave him the green light to be the coach. I do not think Freddie Kitchens will be that good of a head coach. Or, well, you're saying, I don't know yet. I'll put it out. I don't know yet. Um, because when you look at Greg Williams, he would have been the guy I would have chosen. I know people are going to go, man, you're going to take the guy that was part of Bounty Gate. I'm like, look, that was years ago, okay? Like, look, I'm not defending what they did. I'm not defending, you know, they paid money to just knock out players. You know, no. But Greg Williams was the guy that was the head coach, and he has some experience, you know, more than Freddie Kitchens does. Freddie Kitchens was a running back coach that went to an offensive coordinator that went to the head coach. Freddie's a, you know, entertaining personality, but that doesn't really translate to victories. John Gruden's an entertaining personality, and look at how the Raiders are right now. Um, so, but, with all that being said, I'm going to take the Browns here, because I've said this to people, and I've said this in my videos for the last couple of years, about the Titans. The Titans are plain white toast with butter. And with the offseason they've had, they basically have reconfirmed, reaffirmed everything that I've thought about the Titans for the last few years. Um, they were able to re-sign Kevin Byard to a five-year extension, which I thought they overpaid him, but he was a very effective safety one of the better ones, and he deserved it. Um, you know, or, or he, he's a guy that, you know, you had to pay um, for that. Um, you look at, you know, Derrick Henry has been dealing with injury problems. He's been able to practice the last couple of weeks. 
but Derrick Henry is coming off a calf injury. Um, you have Taylor Lewan being suspended the first four games for a PED suspension, which I think is going to be massive, especially going up against the Cleveland defensive line, which is Miles Garrett, Olivier Vernon, uh, and others, you know, great defenders. Uh, uh, Christian Sherbert, uh, Kirks, uh, Kirksley, or Christian Kirksley, uh, Joe Sherbert, that, that's the name. Um, and, you know, they brought in A.J. Brown, they brought in Adam Humphreys. Uh, Adam Humphreys, by the way, is not... is not one of the smartest people in the world because he said the reason why he took the Titans job, he was offered a job by the Patriots, but he said, no, I didn't want to play with, with a quarterback that was going to retire maybe in a couple of years. However, if he had done his homework, he would have found out that Tom Brady said in an interview just before the Super Bowl, he wants to play until he's 45. And unless the Patriots, you know, you know, don't want to do that or, you know, that he'll play until he's 45. So it's a four-year contract. That would have got you right to the end. So, you could have won some Super Bowls, maybe, and been more uh, effective than maybe being with the Titans, where you may be effective, but your results are not really going to be as uh, your your result and your end goal for the year will not nearly be as maybe great as what you could be on the Patriots. Um, but I digress. But I'm taking the Browns here because I'm going to trust that their explosive ability is going to be able to outdo the Titans. The Titans, you know, if the Browns, you know, are undisciplined or they get too emotional. You know, or they don't, they're not disciplined. That may affect them. And also the Titans have this weird history from last year of where you told them to play bad teams. They played about to the competition and they would lose or look bad every time. But there are some times when you doubted them is when they played their best. They almost beat the Chargers last year. They beat both Super Bowl teams from the previous year. Um, one with three fourth down conversions and the other by 28 points. So that's why I'm taking the Titans plus five and a half because I could definitely see the situation again where the Titans are more disciplined. They're going to play, you know, they're going to play effectively and people are going to be surprised going, hey, the Titans are actually going to hold on in this game and they're the more disciplined team. The disciplined and boring, the disciplined, consistent and boring, the plain white toes versus the explosive, fun, new Cleveland Browns. I'm going to take the explosive, fun, new Cleveland Browns because I just think they have more talent and I'm going to trust them in this game. That they're going to be on a good high to get this win. Um, but I'm taking the Titans here plus five and a half because I think that discipline for the Titans will be effective and if the Browns get into some penalty problems or get into some bad tackling issues, I think the uh, the Browns should win this game. So that's why I have Cle- uh, Cleveland winning straight up but the Titans plus five and a half. The next game, the Ravens over the Dolphins. This is one where for the Baltimore Ravens, like this is a... This is a very interesting game because I I feel like for the Ravens, look, the way the offseason started for Baltimore, it was not great. We lost a lot of um, defensive talent that went out the door. We had uh, Terrell Suggs go to the Cardinals. We had Eric Weddle go to the Rams. We had Preston Smith go to the Packers. No, I'm sorry. We had Zedarius Smith. Zedarius Smith go to the Packers. We had Brent Urban go to the Titans. We have uh, C.J. Mosley going to the Jets. I'm okay with that one because the Jets giving C.J. Mosley a $85 million contract. You go ahead and have him. I'm not paying that much for his talent. Um, I know we got Earl Thomas. Eh. You know, like I, I, he's the best safety we've had since Ed, but he's coming off two big leg injuries in two of the last three seasons. I hope he can stay healthy. If he can, we have, I think, one of the better secondaries, or at least I could say the most consi- one of the most consistent secondaries in the NFL with Earl, with Tony, with... Brandon, and Jimmy. Uh, Tavon going down with a neck injury is big, and I hope he can get better. Um, but offensively, like, I'm not sold on our receivers. We got Mark Ingram from the from the Saints on a three-year $15 million contract. That's good. But, you know, how effective is uh, Ingram going to be? Who knows? You know, I know we have Gus Edwards. And we still have uh, Kenneth Dixon. So I think we have an okay three-headed running you know, committee there. And Lamar, who's Lamar going to throw to? Um, because we let Michael Crabtree go. John Brown's now a bill. So we have Willie Sneed, Hollywood Brown, and Tristan Hill, and that's it. And, and Miles Boykin. And I don't know how effective that's going to be. You know, I like uh, Mark Andrews and Hayden Hurst um, as tight ends. Definitely Mark Andrews more. But that offense, I don't know how effective it's going to be. 
I like Greg Roman as an offensive coordinator. At least we have a coordinator that has a history with guys like Tyrod Taylor and Colin Kaepernick and getting the best out of them offensively that wise. But the reason why I'm taking the Ravens, even with my trepidations with the offense, is we're playing right now, in my opinion, arguably the worst team in the National Football League in the Miami Dolphins who are going full Sixers mode by trusting the process. Um, They have basically decided to get rid of every one of their key players (laughs) <laughs> either by trade or by release. Uh, guys that they have let go, Clyde Warford, Kenny Stills was traded, Laramie Tunsil was traded, um, Kiko Alonso was traded. Um, trying to think here, Dwayne Allen, the guy that they brought in, they, they set an injury with, with him. Um, you look at the Dolphins, I think Rashad Jones could go, and a lot of other key pieces for the Dolphins could go. The only one that I, I think is given long-term security is Xavier Howard, who's the highest-paid corner in the league. Um, but, yeah, I look at that in an effective way of the Dolphins just basically trying to tank. They're starting Ryan Fitzpatrick week one, for goodness sake. Um, but here is the problem of where... Um, and this is why I, I hope the Ravens should win, because I just feel like, again, the Ravens have a lot more talent, and the Ravens are trying to win games. The Dolphins, I don't know if they're going to, but if you're a Ravens fan, here's your trepidation problem. In 2007, the Miami Dolphins were 1-15. The only one they had was against us. So we had played horrible Miami teams in the past, and we had choked them out before. So for any Raven fan, do not be surprised that the Dolphins can pull off this win. And also, remember everybody, we're talking about Ryan Fitzpatrick. Ryan Fitzpatrick is the anti-Nick Foles. Nick Foles, uh, and let me explain that. Nick Foles is great if you put him in pressure situations and you ask him to win big games. Ryan Fitzpatrick is the exact opposite. You tell Ryan Fitzpatrick to win a big game, he can't do it. You tell Ryan Fitzpatrick to win a meaningless game in week one, um, where nobody has any expectation, he can outplay his mind. Case in point, last year, he outshot Drew Brees in a shootout, 48-40 to against the Saints as a Buccaneer. So Ryan Fitzpatrick, when you put no expectation on him, is, is at his best. And this Dolphins team has no expectations. So don't be surprised if Devontae Parker... Um, Albert Wilson and these, uh, you know, these, these these other Dolphin players have a field day, or Ryan Fitzpatrick just goes into Fitzmagic mode and plays well. I hope that doesn't happen. I think our Raven defense is going to be disciplined enough to hold on, and that's why I'm going to take the Ravens to win. And I just think, again, the Dolphins' defense doesn't have that much as a pass rush. I think Lamar can avoid some of the tackles they have. They're going to get guys like Vince Beagle um, and other defenders. They have uh, Christian Wilkins, who I'm interested to see on the defensive line. But the Dolphins, yeah, they're not really trying to win. They're not really trying to get anywhere. And I feel like at the Ravens, we have enough talent and enough, you know, consistency to pull out this game. But like I said, I will not be surprised if the Dolphins pull this out. So that's why I like the Ravens here minus seven and the Ravens straight up. The next game, the Falcons over the Vikings. Uh, I'm taking Atlanta here to win this game because I think Atlanta is just a better pure team. All around compared uh, to Minnesota, um, you know, you you could say receivers, Julio, Calvin, Stefan, Adam, you know, you may give that edge to Minnesota slightly, um, but you also have Sanu still there, Hooper, Rudolph, you know, Irv Smith, that's kind of, the, you know, an e- even thing too. I would take um, Rudolph, but Austin, Austin Hooper... Is not a bad option. Um, running back, I would give the edge to Atlanta. I, Devontae Freeman should be healthy, and Dalvin Cook, and Devontae Freeman's better than Dalvin Cook. The Falcons' offensive line has some of the best, off, some of the better offensive linemen in the game in there with Jake Matthews of Alex Mack, one of the better centers. Um, you have a interesting thing with kicker. They brought back Matt Bryant, um, who they got out of who they got out of retirement. Uh, the funny thing was they cut him. Because they wanted to save $2 million, and they ended up paying him $2 million. Um, and I just look at the Falcons as this team that's motivated. Uh, you have a defense that's going to be fully healthy. Keanu Neal should be able to come back and play. You have Trufant still there. You have, uh, you know, they lost Alfred, which I thought was a little big. Not going to lie, that, 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 but you have Trufant. You have Deion Jones. You have Grady Jarrett. You have all these guys signed on long-term deals. Uh, yeah, Beasley, and th- same thing with the Vikings, and, you know, that's a little more equally competitive, maybe in the sense of, you know, Xavier Rhodes, 
Um, Harrison Smith, um, Mike Hughes blew his knee out, but he should be coming back. Um, they just shot, they just signed Brendan Colquitt, a former Browns punter. Um, and you know, I, I look at both these teams as kind of equally competitive, but I think the Falcons, they have a little bit more to prove. And maybe just at the end of the day, when you have games like this, where the defenses have a lot of good talent, the offenses kind of have equal kind of offensive talents. Um, it all, it all comes down to the quarterback and I'm going to trust Matt Ryan who had his best statistical year, uh, of his career, um, to outplay Kirk Cousins, who will once again show that, you know, when you tell Kirk Cousins to play big games, he will put up decent numbers, but he won't win. (laughs) So that's why I like Atlanta here plus four and Atlanta straight up the win. The next game, the Jets over the Bills. This is one where I genuinely, like, you know, I took the Jets because I think they have a little bit more talent. They're, they're a little more talent depth, uh, especially with getting guys like Le'Veon Bell this offseason, getting Jamal Adams for another year, getting C.J. Mosley, um, getting... Uh, Chris Harden is going to be suspended, but I think he's going to be big because that's their starting tight end and one of their best offensive weapons. You're bringing in Josh Bellamy. You're bringing in Jamison Crowder. Um... You, you have defenders and, you know, Big Cat Williams still there. Quinnen Williams is now going to be on that defensive line. I like Sam Darnold a little more than Josh Allen. Um, yeah, and I, I just feel like the reason why I'm taking the Jets to win is because they have a little bit more talent that like, I can like I can trust. Um, and also, I just feel like with the Jets, like, I think Sam's going to, you know, show a good improvement. Where I think with the Bills, what they're trying to do is very much in the sense of they're going to try to play, but with some of the moves they made, they cut the Sean McCoy. He's now with the Chiefs. Um, they're trying to show that they're not going to tank, but they're going to, you know, they're going to take their results how they can get them. They'll, they'll be okay with their results, and they're trying to save a lot of money for the free agency next year. Uh, but De- but Devin Singletary and Frank Gore, that'll be an interesting duo. Frank Gore needs about 500 yards to become the third time all leading rusher, so that'll be something I would tell people to look out for. And now with LaShawn gone, I think that that could maybe be a possibility. Um, but the reason why I'm taking the Jets here, they're home. I like their talent a little more. They have a little more of a ceiling. And I just think the Jets, like, they'll be able to make some more plays. And I think Sam will be able to make a few more plays than Josh with his arm. Josh cannot run Sam. And Josh can do more, has more athleticism. And I think Sam's going to make, you know, more effective decisions. And Rosen, or and Allen will make one tough decision, which may cost the Bills that entire game. It's going to be an interesting game. I think this is, like, the competitive... Cru- you know, crappy toss game of the week. You know, these teams are not really going to go that far, but these two teams are more evenly matched than people should give them. Um, but I'm going to take the Jets. They're home. I like their quarterback a little bit more, and I feel like they have a little more talent to win in this game in that way. <clears throat> so that's why I like the uh, Jets um, straight up, but the Bills plus three. The next game, the Eagles over the Redskins. I'm taking the Eagles here because, again, like this is my Super Bowl pick, and I just think, again, they're all going to be healthy. Uh, they're all going to be motivated. It's a it's a home game, and the Redskins are just really not that good. I think the Redskins, you know, you're having Case Keenum start, and I have a problem with Jay Gruden doing that because I had a I had a problem with Brian Flores starting Ryan Fitzpatrick. You know, Ryan Fitzpatrick and Case Keenum, two guys that are you know journeyman quarterbacks at this point. Everybody knows what they're going to do. You know, they're affected. They're they're some of the best backups in the league. But if you tell them to play more, you know, 16 games, you know what they're going to do. They're going to, you know, make some decent throws throughout the game, but they're not going to be able to make the throw. Or they're going to make the mistake that gets them into that backup position or they'll make it multiple times just because of their ability. Remember, Case Keenan was one of the most prolific passers in Houston. Houston, the University of Houston, has not produced a very good quarterback. Um, so, you know, when you look at Washington, they also have this weird running back room. Of Chris Thompson, Darius Geis, Adrian Peterson's on a two-year, eight million dollar deal. Bryce Love, like you got an you got an injured running back group that they're housing, and you know like, like you'd say, well, you have four running backs, and why do you need them? Well, because all of them, all of them get hurt. Um, you know they cut Josh Dotson. Jordan Reed has a concussion. They don't have their left tackle, Trent Williams. Uh, Donald Penn's going to be in that position. Um, Paul Richards is coming off of a shoulder injury. Alex Smith isn't there. I could just go on and on and on about so many problems of Washington. <laughs> uh, you know, Reuben Foster blew his knee out. 
And I, that's why I'm going to take the Eagles to win because at least I, I have faith in the Eagles' talent, you know, their management, and they're consistent. And they've shown that they can, you know, they're not really going to have to worry about Washington's receivers. But why I'm taking Washington plus nine is that, like, Washington, it's a division game. And that defense on face value with Jonathan Allen, Darren Payne, uh, Ryan Kerrigan, um, and all those other, you know, decent defenders. Landon Collins is now going to be on there. I think that Washington team can, you know, give Carson some interesting moments or, you know, definitely cause enough pressure to maybe get him to, to make some bad throws. Or I think Case Keenum could make enough plays of AP with the receivers they have. Trey Quinn would be a name I would tell people to look out for. But, yeah, I, I just think Washington's a division game, and I just think Washington, their defense is decent enough to where I think they can get some stops or they can, you know, Keenum will make, you know, not that many mistakes to get this to be a blowout game, especially with Carson once playing his first game of the entire year. So that's why I like Washington here, plus nine, but Philadelphia straight up. <clears throat> the next game, uh, the Rams over the Panthers. This is one where I genuinely did, I did not understand as I looked at this game. I didn't understand why people were taking in the Rams at all. Or Rams, the Panthers are actually favored in this game originally. I didn't understand that because I look at Carolina as for the last couple years the most over, um, the most under talented overachievers in the entire league. It was amazing to me how effective. The Panthers have been the last couple years. Like, it, it's this weird thing where when Cam Newton, right, when he's dealing with injuries among his teammates, he gets better. He gets better. Case in point, 2015-2017. <clears throat> last two times the Panthers made the playoff, there were a lot of injuries the Panthers were going up offensively. And Cam Newton carried the load. <clears throat> And you in and, and you look at this Panthers offense again, it's not really that great. Um they lost their center Ryan Khalil, who's going to the Jets. Um, who got got a retirement for the Jets. Thomas Davis is no longer gonna be there. Um you have the only offensive weapon that you genuinely can trust is Christian McCaffrey, who I have um, a lot of respect for and definitely is one of the better backs emerging in the league. But besides that, you have uh what, DJ Moore entering his second year. He's not bad. Curtis Samuel, the injury-prone, you know, bust of a second-round pick. Uh, they just cut Torrey Smith. Greg Olson and Ian Thomas, or, or yeah, Ian Thomas as your tight ends. You know, how effective are those guys going to be? Um, the offensive line, they had to, they have Trey Turner coming off an injury. Um, and I, I just don't really think this Panthers team is going to be that effective. You know, for the Rams, like, this is one of those things where, they had basically a lot of their core back. They brought in guys like veterans like Weddle and Clay Matthews. Um, it's just for them, I feel like, kind of the idea of, of Super Bowl hangover. I think the Rams, just on talent, defensively, they'll be able to shut down the Panthers' offense. Because Cam's not going to be running around as much, and he's coming off a foot injury himself um, in the preseason against the Patriots. But the key thing is, can the Rams look effective and can they look solid throughout? If they're competing with the Panthers, if they're competing... With, um, if the, if the Panthers are competing with the Rams, then if I'm the Rams, I'm a little concerned by that because I just I do not like these Carolina Panthers team. Um, I like a couple pieces on their team, um, but I just think collectively I don't see the talent there to be that effective. You know, if you want to say, well, you got Keekley, yeah, that's great, but Keekley's had you know a few concussions, and you know I don't want him to be like the Jordan Reed or Austin Collie where you're getting into that four or five concussions and you're like. Oh no, he will be a CTE donated brain eventually, and all that. Also, you have Eric Reed there, and you know he, he's having his own issues among the league and you know among players and that. Um, but I just I look at the Rams and say you don't really have to worry about that much offensively when your two main weapons are Chris Hogan and Christian McCaffrey or Chris Hogan and DJ Moore and an old Greg Olson who you don't know who can you know stay healthy. I'll take the Rams to win this game because I know they don't have a tight end, but they at least have Brandon Cooks. They at least have Robert Woods. They at least have, you know, Todd Gurley hopefully able to play. They have Daryl Henderson. They have the offensive line will be an interesting thing with the Rams to watch, <clears throat> especially with Roger Saffold and John Sullivan being cut. They have two rookies probably starting on that line, which I think will be key. And if and if they can't protect, I think that'll be a problem for the Rams moving forward. Uh, but I don't think with the Panthers, even with Gerald McCoy, Brian Burns, 
Bruce Irvin. I don't think they'll be able to generate enough of a pass rush to get Jarek off Razzle. We'll see. But that's why I like the Rams here minus three and the Rams straight up. The next game, the Chiefs minus four over Jacksonville. This is one where I just, you know, I know the Jags, they have that defense. They brought in, you know, old St. Nick from the Eagles to an $88 million contract. He had earned that contract. Um, but I think he is going to be one of those guys that proves he is going to be like the best version of Matt Flynn that ever existed in the NFL. And let me explain. Matt Flynn, you know, the former backup of the Eagles, you know, the LSU quarterback, 2008 national champion, something Jamarcus Russell could not do. Um, he was a guy that went around the league. Or, well, or Matt Flynn got his job in the NFL for a starting job based off one throwaway game in the 2011 season against the Lions, where I think he threw like seven touchdowns against the Lions, who were also a playoff team. You know, the Lions are already in the playoffs, but he did that, right? He goes to Seattle and signs a three-year, $12 million contract to be Seattle's starting quarterback. He was supposed to be starting quarterback. Uh, you know, the Seahawks took this guy, you know, people, you know, maybe you've heard of him, named Russell Wilson, you know, out of Wisconsin. And Russell Wilson was showing Pete Carroll the entire preseason that he was better. And Russell Wilson won the job. Again, Matt Flynn then got traded to Oakland, where he, again, got the starting job. And then he failed out and after week one, and they gave it to Ralph Ryer. But when Aaron Rodgers broke his collarbone in 2013, and they needed somebody to basically right the ship, they tried Seneca Wallace. They tried, uh, oh, man, that uh, Joe, Joe Callahan. I think it was Seneca and Joe Callahan. They went to Matt Flynn, who ended up going 3-3 three and three in his six-game starts that basically got the Packers afloat for that Week 17 game against the Bears where they won off the big pass to uh, uh, Randall Cobb against Chris Conti to win the division. What I'm saying about Nick Foles, how it relates it back to Nick, is that Nick Foles is a similar type of guy, in my opinion. I know he has flipped there, but I think you need a Doug Peterson mind with the talent in the Eagles system to be effective. You know, Nick Foles being in Kansas City, he was a Andy Reid. He got the one win against the Colts when uh, Alex Smith had a concussion. Or I think Andrew Luck went out of the game with an injury anyway. Um, you know, Nick Foles, 27-2, and happened in Philly. Uh, Nick Foles winning the Super Bowl and four playoff games happened in Philly with Peterson with that Philly offense. When he was with the Rams, I know Jeff Fisher was there, and that was a huge point of fairness to, to the problem. Nick Foles got genuinely benched for Case Keenum. Nick Foles was not going to beat that Jared Goff. And I could definitely see for the Jags um, a similar type of situation. Not because I, I don't think Nick, you know, I think Nick's better than Blake Bortles. But Nick's not good enough, I think, with the, the offensive talent that they have. They just cut Terrell Pryor. You're telling him he has to throw to Keelan Cole, James O'Shaughnessy, uh, D.D. Westbrook, Marquise Lee, Leonard Fournette having, you know, injury problems. The offensive line, you know, getting Cam Robinson just back from ACL surgery. I'm just not trusting it. Do I think the Chiefs, you know, could, you know, well, could the Jags defense provide challenge for the Chiefs? Sure. You know, they have some of the best secondary guys uh, in, you know, Ronnie Har uh, Ronnie Hairston, uh, A.J. Boye, uh, Jalen Ramsey. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, like they cut the shot. You have guys like Miles Jack, Yannick Ngakwe. Uh, you know, you have a talented defense. But against this Chiefs offense, with what they have, especially with Sean McCoy now in that backfield, this Chiefs team is going to, you know, be able to show, give it a nice showing on the Jags. And I do not think that Nick Foles, with his talent, the offense talent that he has working for him, uh, will be able to duplicate the same. So that's why I like the uh, Chiefs here minus four and the Chiefs straight up. <clears throat> the next game, the Chargers over the Colts. This was fairly easy <laughs> right after... The Andrew Luck retirement happened. I am. It was that easy when he retired that I genuinely was. I was stunned by it. Um, I I felt bad for him, especially for the fans that booed him. I thought that was wrong uh, to see those fans boo him, but I kind of understand in a way just because of how quick it was that he retired, and nobody and nobody thought this high ankle injury was going to do that to him and cause him to retire. But as soon as he retired, this game was going to be no longer a contest. Uh, you know, look, the Chargers had their own issues. Derwin James uh, missing three months with a uh, toe injury. You have uh, Keenan Allen, who didn't play the entire preseason, coming off of an ankle injury. You have Melvin Gordon holding out. 
and he's not now going to get a contract for the rest of the year. You have a lot of issues going on with the Chargers, but the Chargers have enough talent around them with Austin Eckler, with uh, Nazir Adderley, with uh, Desmond King, with all these other players. The Chargers should be able to form themselves together and be able to win an effective game against the Colt team that just signed Ryan Hoyer to a three-year, $12 million contract with $9 million guaranteed to be their backup to Jacoby Brissett. Do I think the Colts can, you know, maybe some would be competitive? Sure. I think, you know, they have a lot of, you know, unknown stuff about Jacoby. You know, you had the 2017 year, we went 2-11. He did okay, but, you know, who knows? But I'm taking the Chargers here just because they have a lot more talent around them. I think that they'll be able to get through the Colts, and I just don't think Jacoby will be able to make enough plays going against that kind of defense led by Gus Bradley. That's why I like the Chargers here, minus 6.5, and, and the Chargers straight up. The next game, the Seahawks over the Bengals. This was one where I'm taking Seattle to win this game just because, you know, they're just that much better. The Bengals, to me, are the second-worst team in the AFC, second-worst team in the league behind the Miami Dolphins. Um, they, they're not going to have A.J. Green. They lost their offensive tackle, Jonah Williams, with the season, but torn, uh, torn pectoral muscle. Um, John Ross is entering his third year, and he's a bust. Uh, the Seahawks just added Jadavion Clowney. They have Ziggy Ansa. Um, the Seahawks um, have just a lot more firepower to them. They lost Doug Baldwin to retirement, which is big. They lost Earl Thomas to the Ravens. But I think going up against the Bengals team, this is a great game for the Seahawks to start with because they're not really going to have to deal with that much offense provided by Andy Dalton and the, what he has around him. I know you could say, well, they brought in Tyler Eifert for another year. They re-signed Tyler Boyd to a four-year, $36 million deal. And they could be okay pieces. But the Seattle defense was one of the best in the league last year. They were around the top 10 defense, led by Ken Norton. You're going to have Bradley McDonald still back there. Bobby Wagner, highest paid linebacker in the league, $18 million per year. And I, I just really like the Seattle team to be able to fundamentally blow out one of the worst teams in the league that's just trying to rebuild. Um, that's why, like, Seattle are minus 9.5, and, and Seattle straight up. The next game, the Cowboys over the Giants. I'm taking the Cowboys here because I know the Giants, look, everybody's going to talk about Daniel Jones and how great he was. He had a 133 passer rating. You know, he looked great. He played really well. But the Giants have so many other issues, you know, going on. You know, they really, you know, the offensive line looked okay, but, you know, they really didn't make that many big additions there. Their biggest problem is their wide receiving core for crying out loud. When you have Corey Coleman blowing out his knee, Sterling Shepard broke his hand, Golden Tate suspended four games, who was Eli Manning going to throw to this Sunday against the Cowboys? Really nobody. You, well, you could say Saquon and Evan Ingram, and Saquon's phenomenal, but just put nine in the box and just, you know, tell Eli Manning to throw to Evan Ingram and Cody Latimer or all those other guys that he has that nobody knows about. Um, do I think the Giants can, you know, can they play effective? Um, yeah, I think the Giants, you know, they may surprise people. You know, the Cowboys are going through their own issues, especially with Ezekiel Elliott. Um, I do not think they need Zeke in this game because I saw Tony Pollard play in the preseason. He looked okay enough to go up against this Giants defense, which, again, is not that, you know, not that great. You know, they, they replaced Snacks Harrison with Dexter Lawrence, DeAndre Baker, I thought they kind of reached for in the draft. Um, I look at some of the other Giants. They, they still have o Ogletree. Um, I just look at the Giants. They let Landon Collins walk for nothing. And I'm just like, they brought in Jabril Peppers to replace him, obviously. But I like the Cowboys here because, again, I think Dak in that line with Tony Pollard can do enough to manage the game and win effectively. You know, and every, you know, every year it seems like the Cowboys have had a good role against the Giants in the first game of the year. I think the last time the Giants won in Dallas in the Week 1 game was 2011. I know in... <clears throat> no, I'm sorry, 2016. So they've won two of the last seven years um, in Dallas, I believe, in that new stadium. I think it's going to be a, an interesting game. I'm going to take the Giants here plus seven because I don't know how much that Zeke, the Zeke holdout will be in effect. Or I don't know how much, you know, I think the Cowboy offense will stall. Uh, it showed in terms of yards, in terms of points. 
when when Zeke's not in there and Dak's playing by himself, that offense definitely slows down by about a touchdown. And I think with the Giants, they'll, you know, they'll force Dak to throw. I think Dak will make a few more throws than Eli will just because of the talent. But um, that's, and that's why I'm going to take the Cowboys to beat the Giants in that uh, in this game. The next game, the Lions over the Cardinals. The Lions, you know, I, the reason I'm taking the Lions is the Cardinals' offensive line is awful. The Cardinals' offensive line was the worst in the league last year, and I saw that game against the Raiders. Kyler Murray got his crap kicked in over and over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, I like what the Lions, and, you know, and I just trust the Lions have more talent. They have, you know, Matt Stafford, a proven veteran quarterback, that can win these games against bad teams. You have Mike Daniels joining the team. You have Danny Amendola joining the team. Trey Flowers joining the team. They drafted TJ Hawkerson. They brought in Jesse James. Um, the Lions have an okay offensive line. You know, they, they have Frank Ragnarok for another year, which I'm, I'm a big fan of. Uh, you brought in Justin Coleman from the Seahawks. Um, you have, uh, if you like Glover, Glover Quinn go, you still have Darius Slay. Um, I was a little surprised by the Glover Quinn move. You have Carryon Johnson, who hopefully can be your most effective running back since Reggie Bush in 2013. Um, he was actually the last guy to get 100 yards before Carryon did it, before he got hurt. Um, you have um, C.J. Anderson there, the of course the folk hero for the Rams from last year. Um, and I just look at the Cardinals and go, okay, you're not going to have Patrick Peterson um, for six games because he got suspended for PEDs. You have a rookie quarterback going into his first game. Um, you have um, uh, Keen Butler, their fifth-round pick, their biggest wide receiver besides Larry, got her of a hand injury. He'll be out for a majority of the year. Um, you have uh, Robert Alford, one of their top corners they paid, you know, t- t- tearing his pack. He'll be out for two months. Um, you have, uh, you let Robert Ndichie go. You have a guy in Jordan Hicks that they got from Philadelphia who can be okay, but he has an injury history. The only probably most respectable player in that defense um, is Chandler Jones. You let Buda Baker go, one of your uh, okay, for, you know, free safeties. And I just think with the Cardinals, you know, I don't know how well uh, Vance Joseph will do with this defense. Because Cliff Kingsbury, this is going to be his debut, and if he knew anything about Cliff Kingsbury in college, was that he knew how to coach offense, he knew how to score a bunch of points. He had Baker Mayfield, Davis Webb, and Patrick Mahomes at Texas, uh, at Texas Tech. And ladies and gentlemen, he went a grand total of 35-40. and 40. With those talented quarterbacks, and he actually let Baker Mayfield walk away. He didn't think Baker Mayfield was good enough. So you know, uh, I know Cliff has a history with Kyler Mur- uh, Kyler Murray. He was an offensive assistant, or I think he was the offensive coordinator at Texas A&M when he was with Kevin Sumlin when they were there together, and Kyler was there. Um, I look at what the you know the Cardinals have, and I think again they may be able to score some points. The Lions really don't have a second corner that I really trust. Uh, trust they let they just let go of a tease Tabor uh, yesterday, but I'm gonna take the Lions here because I think they have enough of a defensive unit and they'll get enough pressure on Kyler Murray that he's gonna have a rough rough time and I just don't think they'll be able to run the ball effectively, um, and that will cause the Lions to get this victory. And you know for the Cardinals I would say this for Cardinal fans, hopefully Kyler can stay healthy after this first game. But if you can stay within, you know, 7, 10 points, I would take it as a moral victory. I know moral victories aren't great, and I'm usually a person to defend them, but in this situation, look, it's your first game with a new quarterback, new head coach. If you can stay within 10 points, if you can look competent, you know, take that as a sign of moving forward versus moving back. All right, the next game, the Niners over the Buccaneers. This is one where I just trust, I, I'm going to trust Jimmy Garoppolo's potential over Jameis Winston's proven ability. Um, it's because I know what Jameis Winston is. Jameis Winston and the Bucks, they, you know, you have Peyton Barber, you have Ronald Jones, you have basically an offensive line that's core together, you have Mike Evans, you have Chris Godwin, you have O.J. Howard, you have Cameron Bray, um, you brought in Nadamik and Sue, who's replacing Gerald McCoy, you have Vernon Hargraves getting another opportunity to start over again, you have Justin Evans, you have... Uh, Quan Alexander to left, who joined, who joined, who's getting to play his former team. You have Levante David, hopefully being able to stay healthy. Um, and you have a Bucks team that has talent and that can show that they can be, you know, okay. You have Vita, you know, uh, but JPP going down of a, a neck injury, I think, is big. 
Um, he's going to be out for at least you know a few weeks. Uh, Vita Ve, their first round pick from last year from Washington, may not be able to play. Um, and I just look at you know the other corners like Chris Conti and the the other secondary guys they have, and I'm not really impressed with their ability to play corner. Um, and I just think with the Niners, you know, after that first preseason game with Jimmy Garoppolo, who, who looked uh, god awful, or his first when he didn't even make a completion. He at least went 14-20, to 20, threw about 160 yards in TD, his next game out. So, good for him there. Um, but, I'm taking the Niners here because of upside. Uh, I just feel like in the Niners, they have the talent, they have the upside, and they have the potential to be effective. I'm a Bruce Arians fan, and I'm rooting for Bruce, but I just think that with Jameis Winston losing his job to Fitzpatrick genuinely, I think Jameis is a broken cause at this point. Maybe Bruce can prove me wrong. I'd love to see Bruce successful. But I'm going to take the upside with Jimmy Garoppolo with that team, especially with the defensive additions they have, minus Nick Bosa probably, to win this game based off potential and just upside in in this game. I think Jimmy will be able to make some more plays against Tampa than Jameis will against the Niners. So that's like the Niners here to beat the Bucks. The next game, the Patriots over the Steelers. This is one where, you know, the Pats are, you know, they're, they're still a fundamental, consistent team. Uh, they don't really lose home openers that often. Um, Pittsburgh, Big Ben going up against Tom Brady, never never beat him in New England. Never has never done it. Um, do I think Pittsburgh can be competitive? Sure. I think Pittsburgh, you know, you have Connor, you have Joe Hayden signing a two year extension. You have a lot of guys in, you know, Pittsburgh who are motivated to try to prove everybody wrong that losing that losing Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell were not genuine subtractions. It was addition by subtraction. By losing those two egos or those two personalities in that locker room. You may not like that. You may have problems with it. And Big Ben, in my personal opinion, is not a great leader. But if you can hit a central message and fundamentally get around just winning games and getting the Super Bowl. Or getting as far as they can. That will be more effective than having to deal with the distraction and noise that Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown brought the Steelers the entire past season. Um, also, when I just look at New England, like it's something where they have Michael Bennett coming in there. You have J.C. Jackson getting another year. Jason McCourty's still there. Patrick Chung, he may be able to play, though, you know, uh, I think he should be suspended for four games after his cocaine uh, indictment. Uh, you have Julian Edelman coming off of, you know, hand injury. You have Sony Michelle still there. You have James White still there. Rex Burkett's still there. Um, you have Josh Gordon coming back, which I think is significant, you know, being able to play. And again, I'm just going to trust the Patriots to beat the Steelers. Like, this is one of those things. Until Pittsburgh with Big Ben proves that they can go into New England and win that game, I'm going to take the Patriots to win just simply off of that. I think it can be competitive. You know, it'll be interesting to see how they do. But I think New England wins, you know, just based off consistency, big home opener, and the, the Pats just being able to out-execute the Steelers like they typically are able to do. Uh, the last two games, uh, the, tech, the Saints over the Texans. This is one where... I just believe in the Saints. I think that Deshaun Watson, you know, he's getting Laramie Tunsil, which is big, but Laramie Tunsil just got their trade yesterday, and I think he'll be effective enough to, you know, I don't know how effective he's going to be. I think the Saints have a good enough pass rush to get to Deshaun. Um, they really don't, you know, Kenny Stills kind of the same thing. But I think with those two guys, if Stills and Tunsil can play effectively enough, I think they can cover within seven. But I think Drew Brees in that Superdome, all Monday Night Football, a place where a, a setting where he broke the yardage record on Monday Night Football. Uh, but I'm taking the Saints here just because I trust the quarterback, I trust the offense, and they've been able to stay more together as a unit compared to the uh, Texans. That's why I like the Saints over the Texans. And lastly, the Broncos over the Raiders. This is one where I'm going to trust the defense here to beat out the offense. I think Oakland's defense is not going to be that great. It's not going to be that effective. Uh, Antonio Brown may not play. Um, and I just, I like what I saw out of Flacco. I like what I saw out of Vangio in their preseason, especially against the Niners. I think they're going to be able to get, you know, they're going to be able to contain Antonio Brown. They're going to be able to get pass rush to the, you know, to the Raiders. And I think Joe Flacco, with that running game of Philip Lindsay being effective with his arm, with the weapons of having Tim Patrick, Manuel Sanders, Cortland Sutton, I think that the Broncos should be able to be able to pull out this game. So those are my thoughts, comments, and picks for this week. Like, comment, rate, subscribe. Um, shout out to the NFL YouTube prognosticators. Uh, please check out them. Uh, I'm part of that group. And there's a lot of great people with predictions. 
And that's it. So until next week, this is Matt the Fanatic signing off. Until then, so long.